Hi friends, before we get started talking, I want to give a trigger warning. We're gonna talk about depression, self-harm, um, alcohol abuse, all those things, abuse in general. So if that is not your thing, please feel free to keep watching. No harm taken. I'll see you all in the next video. Today I wanna to talk about depression and my experience with depression. And so one thing I should say is that everybody experiences depression differently. Um, there are different effects, there are different uh, scenarios that can cause depression. Um, it could be a chemical imbalance. It could be something that happened in your life. And so I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. I am not a licensed therapist. I am not um, someone who is a professional. I am just someone who experiences depression and I want to share my experience and how I got here. And hopefully this might help you um, be more kind to other people with depression and or seek help yourself. That's my hope with this video. So here we go. So I guess just to start here, that depression doesn't always look like what you think it looks like. A lot of people think depression looks like sadness or, you know, moping around or people being disinterested or kind of like being a, a hermit, so to speak. But for me, it was very different. I was a functioning depressed person. I was a functioning person with depression. And even though I was technically diagnosed in 2017, I know that I was depressed for way longer than that. And the reason why um, I know is because of the symptoms that I had growing up as a child, um, the chaos in my family. And when I went to therapy, that's when I really realized, okay, that's what that name is for that thing. That thing was depression. So let's go back. When I was a child, I was fine. I, I thought I was, you know, a pretty normal kid. And then things started happening in the home. Um, my father left us. Um, there was some abuse in the family. There were some things that were happening that just were not good. And so it forced me to grow up really quickly. It forced me to really like be super um, ambitious, to be super, uh, what's the word? Helpful to be, to feel like I had to carry the world on my own shoulders. And when my father left, my mother became sick. I had to help take care of her and my little brother. And it was just a lot on me. It was a lot on me, but I didn't really have the time to think about what I was going through. I had to survive. I had to help other people survive and I had to help other people um, live. And so I really didn't have any space really to really explore the feelings that I was feeling. And so it wasn't until I got to college that everything kind of broke. When I was in high school, I was very ambitious. I played sports. I made straight A's. I was in AP courses. Um, I was busy. I was in choir. I was in the newspaper. I was very busy. And so looking back on that, I realized that it was me overperforming on one hand, but also trying to busy myself and create my own little escape um, to happier places than what was going on at home. And so when I went to college, I didn't really have all those things, right? I didn't have the friends around me. I didn't have the job that I was used to. I didn't have the sports and the extracurriculars. And I was struggling um, right before I went to college. Um, my boyfriend broke up with me and we were planning on getting married. My parents got divorced that year. Uh, my grandmother passed away that same semester. It was a lot going on <laughs> and I could not handle it. I could not handle it. It was way too much for me to be carrying all by myself. And so, I started drinking. I went to a party and it was the first time I ever like drank drank. I went to a party and I was just drinking. I just, I don't know. I, I just kept drinking and, and I realized that I kept getting into this pattern of drinking, like just drinking to have fun, drinking to escape, drinking to feel happy, drinking. And, I, and it wasn't, it wasn't until later that I realized mm, this is a problem, right? Like this is, this is not okay. And I was using, I was abusing alcohol to make myself feel better or to make myself not feel anything at all. And I would wake up the next morning with like bruises on my arm and you know, it was crazy. And what's crazier is that in college it's normalized. Like drinking culture is the norm. And so I wasn't even aware that I had a problem because everybody around me was doing the same thing. And so if everybody around me is doing the same thing, then it can't be problematic, right? Then it has to be fine. But no, like I was really going through it. I was really going through it. Oof. And then in college, I entered into more romantic relationships, which I probably should not have, but they were all horrible. I was broken up with multiple times, cheated on, dogged, like lied on. It was a lot. And my self-esteem really suffered. It really suffered. And again, I went back to the drinking thing. Consistently, the one thing that could make me happy was drinking. And it kept me, it kept me from having to face the feelings that I was really feeling. And it, it kept me from having to face, um, my fears and my pain and my heartbreak. Um, and also what was crazy is people were telling me that I was more fun when I drank. Like I literally had somebody tell me that I was more fun when I drank. And, um, and it really gave me more reason to drink because like, oh, maybe I'm boring, right? Maybe this is, maybe my drinking is actually a personality trait now. You know what I mean? Like it became something that was really like holding on to me. Like I couldn't shake it. 
And there are horrible things that happened to me in college. Like I was sexually assaulted as well. And when I told my friends about it, you know, they kind of made excuses for this person. They didn't really stick beside me. Um, and it made me feel like I was crazy. Like I felt like I was crazy. And it was at that moment where I really felt isolated. I felt like I really couldn't share my pain. There was really no space for my pain because people were used to seeing me happy and, and helping them and encouraging them and inspiring them. But there was no room for me and my sadness. There was no room for me and my trauma. There was no room for me and my problems. It was all about them. And so, you know, while yes, I was very happy, I was also very sad. Like there is something to being very emotional and very sensitive. People tend to think like, oh, you're just so happy all the time. And it's like, no, like my heart is breaking, but you can't even hear it because you won't listen. And I remember telling one of my friends, this was later in life, um, that I was depressed. And I was like, I'm really going through it. I really feel like I'm going through it. I'm spiraling. And I was really connected to a group of Christians around that time, very connected, very involved. And one of the women said to me, oh, well, you should need counseling because God is your counselor. And I remember thinking, no, that's not it, <laughs> right? Like, like, that's not it. Because even in the Bible, it says to get wise counsel. So like, no, like you're not going to try to gaslight me and tell me that because I'm depressed because I'm sinning or I'm wrong or there's some, there's some sort of flaw in me, right? Not the things that happened to me, right? Not my father leaving, not, you know, the, the burdens of me being a child, not me being sexually assaulted, not men hurting me, you know what I'm saying? Like not me struggling with even trying to be a student or a functioning adult and struggling financially, being overwhelmed by grades and classes. It's like, no, the problem is you, right? The problem is you and your outlook on life. Like, and this toxic positivity was like poured onto me and it felt so heavy because it was shame. It was just a lot of shame around being sad. It was a lot of shame around being broken and not having all the answers for myself. And I felt very alone, very, very alone. I started involving myself in risky behavior. I started to self-harm, which I did as a child. And then I started doing it again in college. Um, so one of my roommate found out and she told someone else and I just felt more shame around that. Like people were treating me like I was something fragile to be broken. It was very discouraging and very hard. And I was so far away from my actual community. And um, it wasn't until one of my friends actually said to me, hey, have you tried about, have you thought about counseling? And I'm like, no, not really. Like I never, th it wasn't really talked about in our home, in school. Like I think you had like three free counseling sessions. And then like after that, you're on your own, <laughs> which is horrible. Um, but she offered to pay for me to go to counseling for the first time. And I said, okay, I'll give it a try, right? But it was expensive. Like we were both college students. And, um, but I'm forever grateful for that opportunity because it was then that I was um, validated that I had a name to give to what I was experiencing. All the hard traumas in my life I've been running from, there was no space to really explore them or to feel them because I was too busy trying to survive and help other people. And I didn't have time to process these things. And so, there was only a few times I was able to go to this counseling session, but later on before I got married, that's when I started going back regularly. And that's when I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And um, when she said that to me, I was like, major depressive disorder, right? Like you kind of feel like, am I broken? Like, am I gonna have to be on medication? Like what's gonna happen? Because what's crazy is you're praised as a black woman for being strong, right? People were like, you're so resilient. You've been through so much and you're so strong and you know, you're brilliant and you're still coming out despite all odds, like everything was set against you and you're so, you're so functional, right? And it's like, that's not a flex and it's not, it's not a compliment, right? It's me surviving. Like, but black women are praised for surviving for so much. We're praised for making it through hard times and nobody is saying, I am sorry that you had to go through that hard time in the first place. You shouldn't have had to experience that. It's more, it's always, it's always like, it's on us to survive, it's on us to thrive. And if we break in any way, that means that we're weak. And that's not the case, that's not the case. Like people could look at me and say that I'm strong, but it's like, I didn't have a choice but to be strong. There was no other option for me because literally who was coming to save me? And I felt that way for so long in my life. Who was coming to save me? My father's not coming to save me. Who's coming to save me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so in 2016, I was finally diagnosed with major depressive disorder. There was a name for it. There is, and, and what was freeing was that it wasn't just this hovering feeling anymore. It was, this is what it is, and this is how we can treat it. This is how we can move forward past this, right? So I personally opted out of the medication um, just because I wanted to try 
other exercises first. And there's nothing wrong with medication. If you need it, you need it. But for me, I just wanted to try it without the medication first and to see if we can move on from there. And if that, and if all other things didn't work, then we'll try the, med the medicine route. And so for me, um, it was, I had major depressive disorder and moderate anxiety. Oh, I had a lot of, I was riddled with anxiety. I was worried all the time about trying to save everybody. And I also realized that a lot of my um, traits in my life, like uh, I feel like this person hates my guts or, or trying to be accepted by people, people pleasing, overdoing, overreaching, overstretching, exhausting myself was a survival tactic as well, right? When you grow up in a household where you don't know if your parent is gonna be volatile or you know, kind, you're kind of walking on eggshells all the time. That makes you anxious, that makes you worry, that makes you fear, right? That makes you question your value and your worth as a child. And so that same mindset I carried with me in college and in my romantic relationships, taking on too much, staying too long, taking abuse. Like I was in an abusive relationship because I felt like this is what I deserved. I felt like love had to be hard. I felt like you had to earn love, like this is normal and it wasn't normal. And so going to counsel, counseling, really opened my eyes to all the traumas in my life. And it really gave me space to cry and weep and mourn about these things that I experienced that I never got to mourn about before because everybody's telling you be strong. Just figure it out. Like life is hard for everybody. And it's like in counseling, I was able to say, this sucks. And somebody was able to validate my feelings who was unbiased, who wasn't in my family, who wasn't a friend, someone who really wants to see me do well, hopefully, <laughs> if, they do their, if they do their job right. Um, so I had language to apply to what I was experiencing, what I was feeling. And so that was freeing, but it was hard. Going to counseling and talking about things and rehashing things was hard. Um, and finding the right counselor was hard because everybody wasn't a right fit. There was a woman that I had and no knock to my, you know, white counselors, but she seemed like she pitied me when I was talking about my thing. She's like, she just seemed so sad at the end of our sessions. And I'm just like, this is not what I need. <laughs> Like, I need you to help me. I need you to give me the tools to, to become better, like to heal. And so I had to, I think I had like about three counselors before I finally settled on the one that I have now. Um, and I still need to look for some more counselors for other things like trauma, people who, spe who deal with trauma specifically, um, people who deal with sexual assault specifically. Like there are so many things that I have to look up because I want to heal. And that is exhausting to have to keep talking about it over and over again. But I'm grateful that I went. I'm grateful that my friend made it normal for me to go, made it like she normalized it. She took away the stigma. Um, she told me I didn't have to be strong. She gave me space to be myself. So she was a great friend in that. She didn't tell me that I had to pray it away like a lot of my other Christian friends did. And I am a Christian and I, and I believe in Jesus and therapy, Jesus and counseling, right? Jesus and medication, like whatever works for you. Um, but this, this gaslighting that happens within the church about um, mental health and how we should always be happy and joyous and Jesus is our counselor, which Jesus is our counselor, but also Jesus put he people here on earth to help us and counsel us through hard times. Just like you have a professor who helps you through learning something, there are people here that are equipped and learned to help you get through the, the hard times in your life. Um, and so there was some stigma around going to counseling. My mother asked me a lot of questions um, and I just, there's a lot of shame in the black community around counseling. There's a lot of shame and stigma around counseling and needing help in the first place around mental illness. And I really would think, I, I think that a lot of us struggle with mental illness and we're not even knowingly doing it, right? We're praised for being strong and for being resilient and all these other things and for using and hustling and grinding, even though these could be tactics for you running away from your problems. Like when I was in high school doing all these things, trying to feel worthy and loved and value like on top of trying to get a scholarship but also trying to feel important like that piece of paper that said that i'm good enough meant something that 100 percent attendance meant something it meant that i was valuable it meant that i was special and i just wish that i had known all along that i was special in the first place you know um and so a lot of the things that we do that we think are normalized or we think that that are like you know things to be celebrated which i'm not knocking that they are like success is is to be celebrated but also Checking in with why you're chasing that kind of thing is important. Like, where is this coming from? Where is it? Some people who get a million degrees, a lot of them just want to feel important. They feel like graduation is the pinnacle of success. And so a lot of people go back to college because they feel like they have to re-enter this program to be validated once again. I mastered it again. I mastered it again. But all along, they never knew that they were worthy all along. You know what I mean? So it really had me questioning everything, everything that I was doing. And black women are so used to suffering. We are so used to suffering. We're so used to illness and exhaustion and feeling less than 
and feeling hopeless that sometimes we don't even realize that something's wrong. It's just normal. Like we just think that that's just what life is. Life is supposed to be hard. Life is supposed to be difficult. And we never take the time to really consider there could be better for me if I'm willing to do the work, if I had the resources to be able to do the work. Cause let's talk about that. Counseling is expensive. If you don't have insurance, even if you have insurance sometimes, some insurances don't even cover certain types of counseling. And so if we had the resources, more black women specifically could get the help that they needed and less stigma around the thing. Cause the woman who told me that I should need to go to counseling was a black woman who probably needed counseling, who probably was shamed for not being mentally well. And so we passed this trauma on to generation after generation, telling women that, we ha that they have to carry the weight all by themselves. And it's damaging. It's damaging. It literally kills you. It literally kills you. Um, there was a time when I was, and at the peak of my depression, um, I was not wanting to live. I did not want to live. And um, I confided in a close friend of mine. And she screenshot my messages and shared them with other people who were not safe people to share with. And, you know, I could try to reason all day with why she did that. I could try to make room for people doing that. And, and I usually do, but I felt so violated. I felt so disrespected because it wasn't shared and like, oh, this is what's happening. Someone help me. It was shared like, oh, look at this. Like she's so dramatic and, you know, and with that, it broke my heart. Like it broke my heart to be suffering to not want to be here, to now be a laughing stock because you don't want to be here anymore. And if someone confides in you about stuff like that, be a safe place, be kind, um, be gentle. You don't have to say anything. Like you don't, you don't have to have the answers, like, right? Like you don't have to fix it because you can't fix it. You can't fix it. What you can do is be a resource. You can guide them to resources. You can ask them like, do you want to go to the hospital with me? I was working at a hospital once and to this day, it still makes me cry. But this woman was there with her friend and I was working in the ER and she comes to the desk and she says, you know, um, I'm here to check myself in. I'm like, okay, like what's going on? Like, cause we have to ask them like, what's the, what's the problem? Um, so that they can, if they're having like a heart issue, then they have to go back immediately. If it's something like a broken leg, you know, we'll see when we get you, when we get you back there horribly. But um, she said that she was there because she didn't feel like living anymore. And I was so proud of her. I was so proud of her friend for coming with her. I was so proud of her for seeking help because even as she said that her, her voice broke because I know the shame that she probably felt. And I was just so happy to be like, okay, it's okay. Like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be normal because I know what that felt like. I knew what that felt like, right? To, to want help. And in my case, nobody really helped me. You know what I mean? Like nobody helped me. I, I had to figure it out by myself and thank God I had friends. Cause when I told my other friend, she called my husband, he came home immediately. And, um, it was a really, really rough time. And uh, I, it took me a long time to heal. I slept a lot, I cried a lot. Um, you know, like, and, and, and depression comes in waves. People think that it's something you're cured from and it's like, oh, it's done. Depression comes in waves. And like I said, people become depressed because of different reasons. Some people suffer with um, seasonal affective disorder, meaning that there's less sunlight, so they become depressed, right? It's blue, like it's gray outside and they get the blues because of that. Or people have babies and there's, there's a chemical imbalance or they feel like they lose themselves and their children or people lose their career or a loved one. There are so many reasons why people become depressed. And once we start to um, recognize that and make room for people to walk through that, I feel like this world becomes a safer and better place for people to be honest about how they feel. Because just because someone doesn't feel like living right now, doesn't mean they're going to stop living right now, right? It's just like, this is just something they're thinking about, but it's important that we hear them. We hear them, right? We're really listening to lead them to the proper place that they should go or the proper resources they could use. You know, um, I felt that way many times, not wanting to be here. But when, when I hit that place in my life, I just really did not want to, I didn't see the point all the suffering, all the struggling, people telling me that it's my fault, people saying that, you know, if you're a real Christian, you wouldn't be depressed. And I felt like everything was on me. And I was so used to being happy. People were so used to me being happy that they didn't know how to handle me when I was sad. They were so used to me being strong that they didn't know how to handle me having the answers for everybody else. When it came to me, nobody had any answers for me. Like, and I feel like that's the plight of the black woman. Like there's a lot of, a lot, there are very few places that we can feel vulnerable and safe enough to really share and lay down our burdens and not to have to feel like we have to be strong and have to have everything together. Right. And so I didn't want to be burdened anymore. That's where that feeling of not wanting to be anymore because I was raised to believe that I was a burden. 
I was raised to believe that if I didn't figure that out by myself, I can't ask for help. Like no one's coming to save me. I didn't want to be a burden. That was my one fear. And I felt like such a burden to my friends because I was depressed. I felt like such a burden to everyone around me, my husband. I felt like I was no good to nobody. I was broke, like I was struggling. And I didn't want to be a burden anymore. So having the people close to you talk down about you and do all these things, like it made me feel like a burden. It made me feel less than, you know? And I just couldn't figure out why I couldn't just be happy. Why couldn't I just be happy like everybody else? Like, why couldn't I just be happy? Why couldn't my life just be perfect like everybody else? Like, and perfect I'm using loosely because nobody's life is perfect. But I have been through so many traumas that when people heard about my stories, like they'd be like, dang, how are you still here? And I'd be like, dang, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, right? Like, because how I feel is almost like I didn't have any time to not be here anymore, right? There was no time to contemplate not being here anymore, which sounds so silly because you just don't be here no more. But then you think about all the people you're gonna let down, all the people you're gonna leave behind, all the people who depend on you. Like there was even shame in feeling like that because I'm so many things to so many people. You know what I mean? So it was, like, it was like the cycle that I could not get out of. I really feel for people who are the strong ones or the happy ones and the people who really don't see them or the people who criticize them like, why aren't you happy today? Oh, like what's going on? Because it's so easy to, it's so easy to kind of be invisible even though you're there. Even though so many people depend on you, it's so easy to be invisible. The thing about being a sensitive person is that you feel deeply. It's not really about being happy. It's just about feeling deeply and so Things that, that grieve me, they grieve me. Things that make me happy make me so happy, right? And so for the people that were expecting me to be happy all the time, it's like you didn't really understand that I'm multifaceted. You only saw the happy things, right? I was so happy to see you that you thought that, oh, my presence is enough, right? Like it's enough to be happy. Depression for me, what it feels like, um, it could feel like a heaviness. Like I feel like I can't breathe. Um, I could feel uninterested. I could feel exhausted, I could feel sadness, hopelessness, um, numbness even, um, just despair, despair. Um, sometimes when I revisit certain traumatic situations, um, I could like spiral, like I could spiral. And I do think I'm, I'm getting more tools to help me through depression where when, when, I'm, not ta when I'm talking about it and I'm not crying <laughs> actively anyway, and if I cry, it's okay too. Like I have days when I cry about what I'm going through, what I feel, um, but I, I definitely feel like I'm getting the tools that I need to actually start thriving in life and not just surviving. And it really took a lot of work to get out of survival mode because I have been in survival mode for so long. When you grow up in an abusive household, when you grow up you know, not knowing what's gonna happen, you're always on edge, you're always surviving. And so now that I'm in a safe space and I'm happy, like I'm genuinely happy with where I am right now and content, like I feel like I can actually start healing now. I can start healing now. And so um, my anxiety, um, my anxiety could feel like a different, a lot of different things. I could feel overwhelmed, I could feel like everybody's mad at me. I could be, you know, worried about what's gonna happen in the future or like stressed about something I said before. Like I'll have a conversation with someone and my anxiety would be like, they hate you. And it's like, it's crazy, right? It sounds crazy, but that's how it feels. It's like, dang, did I say the right thing? I don't know, should I go apologize? And I go apologize to the person. The person's like, what? <laughs> what are you apologizing for? So mental illness is real. Um, mental illness is uh, something to be accepted. It's, it's something that a lot of us go through that we don't even know because we don't have the language and we don't have someone affirming that that's what's happening. I recommend everybody go to therapy. Everybody go to therapy. Everyone go. Like, because you don't need to go to therapy just, just when something is wrong. You go for maintenance. Just like when you go take your car for maintenance. You don't go just like when, you know, problems are arising or your, your thing is smoking. You go to keep it from happening. So I feel like we need to make, make, um, make it a priority um, to take care of our mental health. And I also understand that there is privilege with going to seek mental help um, because it's expensive. And sometimes there is shame around it, especially around your family and things like that. Um, but what I, I share, I share openly because I want you to feel open to share as well. You, you to feel open to heal. I share with my family, my mother, my aunt, like, no, yeah, I go to therapy. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have depression. Yeah. Um, you know, and and when I first said that around, around my parents, when my mom specifically, got, I felt like she felt a way about it because she was like, dang, like, you just gonna say like you struggle with depression? I'm like, yeah, I do because so many of us do. And I want her to have the freedom to feel like she can be honest about her experiences as well. You know what I mean? Instead of pushing it all down and having to be perfect for everybody. Life is hard, you know? And so I'm working through all these things one day at a time with kindness, with gentleness. Um, I'm working through it in therapy with friends, um, just being like being able to be vulnerable and be safe, like with myself journaling, praying, 
um, praying and, and therapy, but also in my music. And I wrote this song called Sing, which is literally a song I got in my sleep because when, I'm, when I feel depressed, I can feel like paralyzed. And the one thing that helps and heals me and soothes me is singing. It feels so good. It doesn't have to make sense, like, but singing just feels so soothing to me, so healing. It's like salve for my soul. And so I wanna share this song with you called Sing. Um, again, it was inspired when I was going through a depressed state and I was singing a song with Childish Gambito in, in my dream. Um, he's not on the song, not yet, <laughs> but this song really means a lot to me because it really is a song of hope and of joy in spite of sadness and depression and a song of honesty. Like when you're stuck in your bed, when you're in your head and you can't get out, like sing, sing, like sing, sing to ground yourself, sing to see yourself, sing to affirm yourself and to remind yourself that it's going to be okay. So again, this was a lot in this video. Um, I hope that you were able to get something from this. Know that you're not alone. Know that um, we're out here. People who struggle with depression are out here. We're living, we're thriving and uh, it takes work, but I believe that you can thrive too. You can thrive too. And I'll provide some resources below if you struggle with depression or thoughts of not wanting to be here anymore. Um, I'll provide those as well. And I hope you enjoy the song. Take the song with you. And I'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Stop.